Okay, uh, standing beside me here is a French 75 field gun, 75 millimeter field gun, probably the 20th century's most uh, famous field artillery piece. It uh, actually started in late in the, the 19th century. Uh, the French uh, felt that their loss of uh, the Franco-Prussian War in the 1870s to, to the Germans was largely due to their obsolete artillery use, so they set out to create a new world standard in self-defense of the, the, the France. And um, a lot of the development work began as early as the 1890s. Uh, they began working on rapid firing uh, field pieces, which uh, were in the 50, 60 millimeter range for experimental purposes. The purpose, of the, the objective was to create a field piece that had uh, uh, certainly a, a, a lethal payload but also rapid fire and the ability to uh, uh, and achieve rapid fire, they needed to overcome the issue of recoil. So the, the heart and soul of the, of the gun is what's underneath the gun barrel. There's a, a, a hydraulic uh, buffer or sometimes more often called a recuperator, which uh, takes uh, five tons or more of energy that's generated by the recoil of the gun and slows it to a gentle stop within a 44 inch range, then returns it back into its original position with great precision. Uh, the importance of that is if for rapid fire, uh, the gun has to go back to its starting point uh, very precisely, or you will have ammunition falling short at a distance. It, it's uh, radically affected by that. So the recuperator was the secret to the gun. It was in, developed by the French as a national secret. There's a, a whole uh, culture in French history about the, 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 uh, the sous the, the, the basically the secret weapon of the French. Uh, and, and indeed, when they got into World War I uh, in 1914, they credited the gun largely with saving their country as the Germans were uh, closing in on Paris, the, uh, the last ditch stand that French artillery made basically obliterated, you know, whole, whole battalions of Germans. Uh, and it, it worked uh, as, as hoped, as designed. Uh, and, and it became, it, it set a whole new world standard. Um, as I developed my own interest in, in uh, the artillery history, I, uh, it was perfectly obvious that, that there are a few field pieces in history that, that were real uh, game changers, and this was, was one of the most important. Uh, almost to this very day, the principles involved in the French 75 are still present in, in modern artillery with certainly uh, significant add-ons and improvements, but um, the, uh, it, it, the, what, what uh, was achieved with this is still very, very, very relevant. So, uh, as a uh, as a aspiring collector, I um, uh, made it a goal over 30 years ago to uh, to to acquire one. I wanted one, you know, and I knew very, very rapidly that they were scarce. Um, not scarce because they were few made, because there were probably more French 75s built in the 20th century, perhaps than almost any other field piece. The French serial numbers I've seen range up around 25,000. Uh, by the end of World War I, the guns in service were in the, mostly in the 17, 18,000 serial range that actually saw combat, but they kept production up for another year and really topped the number. So there are plenty of them made. Uh, the French sold them to the Polish and the Americans and one or two other countries between 1920 and, and, and 40. Um, and uh, of course they lost all of theirs in 1940 and the Polish lost all of theirs. So that made the, the German uh, uh, you know, interest area, having the majority of them. The United States acquired the Malm 2,500 or almost, almost 3,000 of them. A few, a few were built in the U.S., but only a few, maybe 400 gun tubes. Um, we um, 
used them in World War II. They were modified, in our case, used in training, and the Germans reused a lot of them. So they, there were a lot of them made, but there aren't many in North America. And what, uh, what few horse-drawn carriages, uh, guns on car horse-drawn carriages of this model, that uh, we can find uh, most of them were converted to salute guns and uh, many of the parts were disabled or discarded in that process. So uh, finding a gun like this was more of a, uh, more of a hunt and pick type thing. I, I acquired uh, two guns, two salute guns, which were incomplete. The recuperators had no moving parts. Um, shields were missing. The um, many mine other parts were missing on one or the other, but fortunately, Within the first two, I had at least one cop sample of each part that I really needed to reassemble a gun. Uh, you also have to respect federal law. Uh, the gun, by its nature, it, it falls within the Gun Control Act of uh, 1967, 68, and uh, and to uh, to acquire this, I had to get a collection of parts that did not constitute a destructive device on their own and uh, then a file a permit with uh, application to uh, build a destructive device, technically kind of an experimental thing. Um, and once the application to, uh, was, was, a you know, was approved, then I could proceed with uh, building the missing parts uh, and uh, assembling the gun. And of course, it's, it's uh, federally registered. Uh, to bring, it, to bring it outside my home state of Michigan, I have to file paperwork with a destination listed on the paperwork, which indicates where the gun can be found at every moment, basically. Uh, so come, coming down to Tennessee, I usually takes about six weeks to get that permission back by mail or in one case, email in a hurry. Uh, they were real nice about it. Um, but uh, that's, that's, that's kind of... Um, the way I got into it, 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 is, uh, it is, as far as the federal government is concerned, it's a new cannon, uh, but it's made from old parts. And uh, it has my name as manufacturer stamped into the breech, permanently stamped, and it's, uh, so it's, uh, it's, uh, it, it's, it's part of the, you know, the database and the, and the uh, uh, you know, federal inventory of controlled items. So. Um, I um, uh, have uh, gone, you know, then on into the ammunition, you know, and uh, over the years I collected almost uh, 75 pieces of original artillery brass cases that uh, were pretty popular as bring home souvenirs. I didn't really collect the ones that were turned into lamp vases. They were unusable for my purpose, but uh, I acquired a sufficient number that I could uh, uh, metallurgically uh, uh, treat them for, you know, uh, stress relief and anneal and resize to fit the gun. And, uh, and once, uh, once, once they're resized and fired in the good, uh, they're gone good for uh, several firings and they usually hold their, their shape until they're worn out and crack split or something. And so that's, uh, it's a relatively limited life to the ammunition cases, but they can be found and uh, with considerable effort and rehabbed and uh, ammunition that uh, we're firing here is uh, all inert ammunition. It uh, is a solid, it has no exploding, uh, uh, you know, feature to it at all. And uh, it's basically, uh, you know, target ammunition and that only. But it creates a, a very interesting, um, you know, and a very interesting uh, uh, ballistic challenge to build the ammunition uh, back to standards and uh, get it to perform. I shoot the gun basically uh, with ammunition prescribed by 1916 French standards as a reduced load. It's only about, has 60% of the original muzzle velocity, which is certainly adequate for, uh, you know, recreational instructional purposes. And, and uh, that's kind of the nature of the ammunition. Uh, in, in, in getting the material together, I soon found out that of all the parts I needed, the one that was the most difficult was the original sight mount. Um, the guns were uh, brought in in 1940. The U.S. guns were, were all uh, 
brought into the ordnance department and weeded out. The most worn out specimens became salute guns. They retained their horse-drawn carriages, but they, all of the sights were scrapped because it's a nice big brass piece and that one, scrap was valuable in 1942. Uh, so they, uh, they were systematically, uh, the sites were systematically scrapped when, and uh, the very few that we could find were attributed to guns which came in to the United States, uh, mostly uh, a small number that the French government donated to the uh, American museums as a uh, appreciation gesture. Uh, you know, for our participation in both world wars to their benefit. Um, so uh, at any rate, I, I, I've found a number of, of um, sites, a small number, but they were all on guns in, uh, owned by institutions and not really accessible for the kind of close study and dismantling that would be necessary to reproduce it. Um, Fortunately, a, a friend of mine that's a, a PhD librarian and a bookophile and, uh, and also travels a lot in Europe and made many contacts in Europe and other parts of the world on the subject of artillery, uh, Dr. Jim Scherning in uh, Newtown, Pennsylvania, uh, discovered a set of drawings dated in 1916 of the Model 1901 uh, site uh, for the Colometer site for the... Uh, for the, uh, for the French 75. Now, the site consists of a, a massive site base with many moving, complex moving parts and two removable parts. One is a, a column that uh, I can show you a little later uh, that uh, slips in the site base and the other is a, a precision level that's part of the site base. Those two parts can be found on the antiques market. They're uh, the site Columns have usually found in France and often in uh, very dug condition, you know. Uh, uh, but a lot of the spirit levels can be found in United States machinists' toolboxes. These, those came home in shirt pockets and that sort of thing and became precision tools for some veterans and uh, are generally unrecognized by uh, the later generations of tool makers. So I have found uh, a, a fairly decent number of those parts on the antiques collecting market, but the site base was absolutely uh, uh, very, very difficult. I ultimately acquired one complete working original base. Um, I had, after advertising for years, and this was like a 30-year quest, on and off, I uh, managed to uh, be at a military show in the United States, which was frequented by uh, a lot of European collectors. And uh, I had a poster on my table, a picture of the site base, uh, a photograph of one, and uh, wanted, I had it translated into French and ending, you know, and it was in both French and English. and. And uh, two gentlemen came by the last few minutes of the show and one said something to the other and he spoke up and said, oh, my friend here has one back home. So I got, I got to be friends with his friend and uh, he lived in, in uh, France in the Verdun area and uh, was a collector of, uh, of uh, French military. And he, uh, he had needs, he wouldn't sell his site base, but he... He wanted uh, certain things for his collection that are very hard to find in France, and I was able to acquire those. And uh, it took several years in this negotiation, but ultimately I, I got one working site base. Uh, and about this was just after Dr. Scherning found these these um, these drawings, and so. Uh, now that, now that I have one working gun with one working sight mount, there are many museums, many meaning uh, tens maybe, <laughs> of, of museums and collect pri some private collectors, a very number, probably less than 10 that I know of, all of whom would really like to have a copy of that. So this has kind of been a challenge to... Uh, uh, take uh, those drawings and proceed uh, without destroying the original somewhat by having to even dismantle it, you know, 
for uh, you know uh, copy work and stuff. So being able to work off of the uh, the, the drawings and the, the help that uh, my, my young friends here have given me, uh, uh, and the work they're doing essentially, I'm not <laughs> doing that much of it, but uh, uh, I certainly appreciate uh, you know their interest in this project and ability to carry it forward and. Uh, just had the pleasure of uh, showing some of my other friends at this location, uh, uh, and it's like, wow, everybody's in awe. <laughs> um, so, uh, discussion from here, I guess I can, I can mention, here's the first couple of pieces. The, uh, uh, if we want to move over to the gun, we can uh, maybe get a better look at it, okay? As you can see, uh, this gun is mounted to uh, the recuperator. This is the part that handles the recoil and all the aiming is, is, is part of this. So this, uh, the, this complex bronze piece of equipment fits on, uh, uh, on the gun at this location. It's, it's fastened on in a way that the users of the gun don't have the ability to remove it. Uh, the only thing that removes is the uh, this collimeter base pops right out. And uh, this is normally stored in a leather pouch over here. And the fact that it was a removable part is the reason that it can be found, you know, likely they got separated for guns. But this, this was rarely ever separated from the guns until the guns were heavily modified and so they're systematically scrapped. There is one other removable part. This is the little sight. Uh, um, Barry, I'm going to let uh, Darian hang on to that right now, and I'll pull this off. And there's a little lever we pull here, and we lift this up. This was folded up and went in a leather pouch, and the sergeant of the piece was able to kept this with him. So these are like two critical things. With these gone, the gun is relatively useless. You know, it has very little long, no long range, uh, you know, fire capability. Uh, so they, there were spares of these kept in boxes and, uh, uh, and sometimes, you know, were, were put in place. But as you can see, this is the, this is the mount and the, uh, the reproduction here is, is well along in, in creating this, uh, this part of the mount. So we're looking forward to, uh, keeping the project moving and, and completing, uh, plastic copies of all these parts. And after that, we will address the issue of going from plastic, uh, plastic masters to uh, investment casting bronze, you know, or wax casting for, uh, a, you know, complete replication of the site. Now, challenges, of course, will be is to reproduce some of the markings. Uh, some will, they'll all be marked as reproductions, but we still would like to include most of the uh, the control uh, in you know information, but there's very and, and it, there's only a, a couple of motions they have to make, but they are very uh, they're very very precision, and uh, uh, so this is going to be a uh, you know very interesting challenge. Okay, the recuperator is this this thing right here, and it, it's it's about 60 inches long. And there are a set of rollers. There's a pair of rollers up there, and a pair of rollers here, and a pair of rollers here, and then it's hooked. The, uh, it, it's hooked to the gun by a coupler underneath here. Uh, yeah, we'll just show you. Yeah. Um, so it, 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 it's coupled right here. There's a big, massive key, and when the gun recoils, there's a, 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 a hydraulic piston rod here. And when it recoils, the oil in the upper cylinder is, is pulled back this way, and there's a connection between the upper and this lower cylinder. This lower cylinder contains nitrogen at 1,700 PSI. And in between the two is a floating piston so that when the oil is brought back here during the recoil, it, uh, it, is, it pushes down and it pushes that floating piston forward, super compressing the nitrogen that's in there above the 1700 PSI. 
as that has calculated to slow the gun down within 40 inch travel, uh, at the get, get, it slows down, gets to the end of the travel, then the nitrogen is pushing in the piston to get back to its 1700 PSI pressure, and that pushes the oil forward. And then there's a little breather valve up there so the air that's sucked in behind the piston can get back out. And, uh, and so that's the cycle. This provides a phenomenally high rate of fire. Once this is, gun is properly uh, dug into position and properly aimed, it can be fired 30, 40, 75, 100 times without making major sight adjustments. You know, it, it, it's, it's able to, these were capable of putting an 11 pound high explosive shell out 1200 yards and have seven projectiles in the air before the first one arrived on target. So you could really throw a stream of metal. Uh, the 75 millimeter cartridge was deemed by the French as adequate, you know, for the, uh, the 1890s when it was developed. It uh, proved adequate in the early phases of World War I. By the end of World War I, most artillery recognized that uh, going to a heavier projectile like 105 millimeter would be the wave of the future. So when the Americans uh, you know, got into 20th, mid 20th century, we developed our own family of 105 millimeter guns and the 75s were relegated to special roles and especially where lighter projectiles were needed. But as some mountain hauser crews of 75 millimeter guns pointed out, even the little ma uh, pack housers that, that were only 75 millimeter in World War II could put more pounds of metal in a target in less time than the 105s because they had a higher rate of fire. And so if it wants metal on target, there was to a well-managed battery, the 75 miller was still very effective in, in the ninth in World War II. Um, but uh, in today's world, that's my understanding, there's uh, you know about 155 millimeters in my, the most common you know artillery support that uh, is in our current you know military establishment um, which I'm not qualified to comment much further on <laughs> to load the French 75 is a very easy and quick to load gun if the gun has been fired the breech is opened up to this position a cartridge with a shell is put in closed rapidly then the gunner okay the gun the man firing the gun is seated here and he pulls this hammer back and on the order to fire he lets go that fires the gun then he opens the brass like that and the brass flies out the next one can go right in so operational time is, uh, is very short uh, per round to prepare the gun for firing the uh, the one gunner moves a uh, a line of sight elevation gear which is independent of the actual elevation for firing he will move this until he, he has a precision level that sits, is just held on these two points. And when the gun is completely level, he then comes over here and adjusts the uh, firing range uh, in meters uh, is on this drum. And, and so if the gun's been leveled and he wants to shoot at a certain distance, he can either gets orders and consults the chart, and then at a thousand yards, he would move the gun up with this particular version of ammunition to uh, the 1325 graduation here, then the gun can be fired and it should be expected to be on target 1300, uh, well, at, at the thousand yard range, if that's what we, you know, was converted from the chart. The other controls, on the gun, uh, another gunner sits here and uh, he controls the right and left traverse. If you notice, the gun moves easily on its axle. So to adjust fire from the right and left, this, uh, this, this wheel does all the work. Then to sight, if a, 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 a target area or a reference sight is, is known forward of the gun or even off to one side, by using this sight, you can move the sight to whatever your reference point is 
and then with map coordinates, the gun is, is fired ac accordingly in your, your target area, the actual target area is, is, is uh, then impacted. Uh, so this, this site provided both direct and indirect fire.